The analytical mind can explain the world around us, but the creative mind can help create our future. Today's guest explores the power of Afrofuturism in comic books, the expression of creativity in the midst of pandemic, and the way we think about and process history as a society. He's Dr. Julian Chambliss this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Joining me from his home in Rhode Island is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week we talk about big issues with great guests, authors, journalists, artists, and more to make sense of the stories that shape public life in the United States today. This week, we're joined by Dr. Julian Chambliss, a multi-talented scholar, author, podcaster, curator. He's also a member of the Department of English at Michigan State University, where he joins us today. Julian, it's great to see you again. Oh, thanks for having me again. Well, so a lot has happened in the world and in your career since we were here, well, not here, but together, uh, I guess about four years ago. Uh, and we want to talk about that, but let's talk first about the $3 million grant Michigan State University has from the Andrew Mellon Foundation to explore creativity in the time of COVID. I understand that this involves art, gardening, and social media videos. Tell us about it. Well, this is a project that was funded um, through the Just Features Initiative at Mellon. Um, this was a project that originated uh, with my colleagues and um, Natalie Phillips and Nancy Joy. Natalie is in the Department of English. Nancy's in uh, Writing Rhetoric in American Culture, RAC. Um, they both noticed as they we were going into lockdown as the pandemic started, how much the creativity had helped to shape how students were responding in that rapid transition to living online and trying to complete classes and doing things online. And so when this call for the grant came, they used an already sort of established set of surveys that have been developed in the Digital Humanities Literary Cognition Lab, which is founded by Natalie and, and sort of situated in the English department. And Nancy came on as an expert on surveys, and they really started to think about, is there a way we can sort of explore how creativity is a tool for everyday people to respond to the stresses of the pandemic? And with the Just Futures call, they really envisioned a massive uh, collect call for creative works from everyday people to see how the ideas and, and traumas and experiences associated with the pandemic were sparking different kinds of creative outlets. And this is important to recognize this is not about necessarily artists per se, but everyday people and their turn towards different kinds of creative activity, be it gardening, be it making TikTok videos, be it scrapbooking, be it dancing. What are they doing uh, in this very dynamic, very historic time to cope with the traumas and the experience and the reality of the pandemic? And ultimately, our goal is to circulate uh, this call all around the world and bring to uh, a kind of digital repository, a collection that represents what people want to give us, and also to do a physical show here and in several places around the country that reflect uh, what we collect. So you, you said you put out a global call. How many respondents, how many people did you hear from? I mean, what, well, what numbers are we we're talking about? Well, actually, we're very early in the process. So the the actual um, grant process was in the summer. We found out uh, at the beginning, uh, at the end of last year, and really our grant period it starts 
this year and runs to 2023. And so we're really at the beginning of the process of, of sending out the call. Uh, and so uh, what we're doing right now is actually fine tuning um, that, that survey, that online document, and also thinking about uh, different sort of good faith alterations. So with paper surveys, for instance, or translating the survey into different languages that we'll do in the next year and send out in a sort of like series of cycles of collecting. So we haven't actually sent it out yet. So you're actually talking to me as we, you know, we had a meeting just yesterday about um, what are some of the sort of feedback we've received from community members and scholars about the sort of early versions of the survey that they've seen. And as we put those, so uh, that feedback into, into practice, you'll start to see us sending out messages and asking people, yes, please um, participate in this project. And this will be going on for really the rest of the year. So I, I can't project how many objects we might collect, um, but there's an assumption here that will be more than, more than one. Julian, if if someone in our audience had something they wanted to to contribute to the to the body of 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 of, of creativity that you're collecting, is there a way that they can do that? Yeah, what they can do is um, go on the web and go to our. Um, Digital Humanities Literary Cognition Lab website. There will be a page there when the project goes live where people can click and uh, take the survey and um, upload their material. It's important to recognize that, at least in this particular uh, process, there is a sort of digital submission in the initial stage. And as I say, like we sort of recognize that we're going to have to make these sort of good faith modifications for people who don't necessarily have digital access to like, as I say, if you want to do a paper submission, you know, how are we going to work those things out? But our initial goal is to sort of circulate this sort of digital survey and the Digital Humanities and Literary Cognition Lab, the DHLC at Michigan State University. That's the place that you can go and find out about it. And don't worry, there will be lots of social media that we're going to put in a place around the project and call different calls that we'll be putting out via different social platforms. And hopefully um, when we do this, I'll, I'll definitely make sure uh, to tag you guys and let you know that this that we're live taking in submissions. But you know, we wanna be as, as respectful as possible about um, the willingness of people to participate. And that's why we're being careful in terms of making sure that the format and the wording and the language that we're using um, is appropriate and, and signals to people our commitment to taking uh, serious their stories and understanding the different experiences in a very dynamic uh, moment in, in global history. If, if, if we can just step back for a second from the, from the actual goods of the project and just talk for a minute, uh, just even from your own experience about what creativity has meant for you in the context of the pandemic. Well, you know, I think it's a, a really dynamic moment to think about how different kinds of creative outlets have allowed people to respond to um, really systemic uh, injustice or, you know, institutional failures. I think about this in the context of, of speculative work. A lot of my work sort of touches on things like Afrofuturism. So you see a lot of those narratives, both historical and contemporary, being referenced as people try to understand what's happening in terms of the pandemic and how institutions like the government are um, sort of systemic imbalance within a sort of uh, capitalist society, how they're affecting people in different ways. And you can see it in on um, platforms like TikTok, you can see it in social media, you can see it in public art, you can see it in, in lots of different ways that people understand and are using different kinds of creative outlets to make clear their feelings about the moment. And so this is one of the things that makes uh, the potentialities around this project so impactful. It's the ability for people who are doing many different kinds of things to make their feelings about this experience clear uh, and, and to recognize also that what they're thinking, what they're doing, what they're feeling uh, corresponds to other people, both in their community, but also perhaps around the world. 
So you're also a force behind mapping the sonic imagination and a past unremembered, the transformative legacy of the Black speculative imagination. They explore Afrofuturism. So for those in our audience who may not know what that is, break that down for us. I found this very intriguing and, and, and exciting, actually. So Afrofuturism, of course, is um, a Black speculative movement that has gained a lot of attention um, when we think of sort of current moment, the success of the Black Panther in 2018 brought the idea of Afrofuturism to the public mind. Sometimes Afrofuturism is very simply sort of thought about as future-oriented narratives involving African Americans in space or in other kind of speculative landscapes. But I like to think about Afrofuturism and what motivates uh, those exhibitions that you reference is Afrofuturism is really to the intersection between Black speculative practice and liberation ideas, right? I, I always try to describe it to students as intersection between speculation and liberation. And how does that play itself out in multiple spheres of knowledge and information and practice that have that bring African Americans to the center? So Afrofuturism and its original definition, which was coined by Mark Derry in 1994, really puts a lot of emphasis on signification associated with like technologically enhanced futures, right? Cyborgs, people in space. But Afrofuturism, Afrofuturism as a philosophy that's developed since then really encompasses the consideration of the Black past, the Black present, and the Black future in a kind of epistemology of transformation and liberation that is advocating for a different set of beliefs practices and structures that protect, nurture, and, and promote a better future. So if, if you go on the website, there is a page that talks about legacy, which is not speculative imagination of the future, it's the past. How is that uh, entwined with, with this concept? So when we think about um, speculation, I like to point out to students and to the public Whenever a person of color has been alive, especially in the context of the Western Hemisphere, they have dreamed of a better future. So in that context, there is a long history of people of African descent, especially in the Western context, dreaming for structures and imagining structures and working towards structures that are more free, that, nur that nurture and protect, that advocate for equality. This is an important element of the Black contribution to the American democratic pro uh, project. You think about the idea of Black people enslaved working actively to abolish slavery. Once free, uh, those former slaves, those freemen working actively to help reconstruct the country and advocate for democracy. And even the sort of like long civil rights movements that emerge in the post reconstruction period where African Americans are pushed out of the public sphere and then work very diligently over generations to establish themselves in the public sphere and make sure that citizenship lives up to the ideologies that are associated with it. These are all legacies that we can associate with a black speculative practice. In a practical sense, this is often, I point people towards early literary works that are written by African-Americans that are in fact offering up critiques of the political system imagining freedom and imagining different ways to achieve freedom. People like uh, Martin Robeson Delaney, who was a contemporary of Frederick Douglass, who wrote Blake, Huts of America, which imagines a hemispheric um, slave revolt, or someone like Sutton Griggs, who's writing in the 1890s in response to things like uh, the leopard spot and the rise of scientific racism and the lost cause mythology, who writes Imperial in Imperium, or even someone like Pauline Hopkins, who in uh, Of One Blood really offers up what is essentially a proto Wakanda, where she has a, a character find out that they're the, the heir to a uh, sort of hidden African kingdom in Ethiopia. So there's a legacy here of Black people imagining a future in the context of literary art and artistic production, often in opposition to the regressive political landscape that they're living in. 
And you have some great creative talents involved here. And I wanted to mention just two of them. Chuck Brown, he's written for The Punisher, Wolverine and Black Panther, and the Gibbs sisters. Talk about the, these these two people or these three people in, in particular, but also just in general, how you got such an really an all-star cast and people contributing. Yeah, I wanna I wanna um, clarify because um we're talking about actually a couple of different um Ex exhibitions. So okay. one exhibition, which one that you referenced, Mapping the Sonic Imagination and the Past Unremembered, is actually at the Zoyna Hurston Museum in Florida, which is part of my work curating the Zoyna Hurston um, Arts and Humanities, uh, Festival of Arts and Humanities. And that that is those particular uh, installations. One is sort of looking at the past and one sort of looking at sound. And the one you just referenced is Beyond the Black Panther, Visions of Afrofuturism in American Comics, which is actually an exhibit that I curated at the MSU Museum. And so in that, that installation, Beyond the Black Panther, these are um, comics that I have curated. This is an online exhibit. And the goal here was Again, when we think about the origins of Afrofuturism, with the original definition that was offered by a cultural critic Mark Derry, well, when he's coming up with this definition of Afrofuturism, he's actually referencing comics. He's, he's using comics as um, one of the examples of Black speculative practice at the time he's writing in 1994. And he uses specifically milestone comics. And when people talk about Afrofuturism, scholars and, and critics and curators a lot, they, they tend to leave out comics, even though it's in the very origin narrative of the term. And with this exhibit, I sought to, again, think about this longer history of Black speculative practice and connect it to a longer history of Black comic production and point and say, hey, this is an example of that black speculative practice we associate with Afrofuturism in comic form. So in that regard, there's a long history, often unknown, of black comic production. And some of the people that you mentioned, Chuck Brown, who is a writer who helped create the comic Bitter Root, which is an Eisner Award winning comic. He just finished uh, a limited series called On the Stump. Both of these are of speculative works that deep, uh, dig deeply into questions of race representation, power, uh, politics. Um, I, I pick his comic in part to sort of talk about a recurring set of themes that are associated with Afrofuturism. And Beyond the Black Panther as an exhibit is really built around recurring themes, right? So the themes of like uh, a, a Black past, like a legacy, uh, metaphysics, community, uh, gender. These are things that unify when you see Afrofuturism in different spheres and different spaces, let you know that this is Afrofuturist, right? I'm always very, very careful to explain to students just because you see a Black person in space doesn't mean necessarily <laughs> that it's Afrofuturism, <laughs> right? And and that's important, right? Because like it, the sort of simplistic, uh, a simplistic sort of description would be like, well, if you see a Black person in space, is Afrofuturist. And, and there's a way where that logic makes sense because a lot of the narrative of future that framed the 20th century tended to omit people of color. Think about the sort of sci-fi imagery of the 1950s. Very difficult or at all for you see Black people in that. Really not until the 1960s do you get this really popular expression of Black people in space and that's Ohura on Star Trek. Right. right, which is this sort of like watershed moment. And so what, when bringing and searching for these comics in the show, Beyond the Black Panther, I'm looking very specifically at examples of Black comic creators producing comics that are um, sort of fitting within a framework of Afrofuturism. So the Gibbs sisters with the invention of E.J. Whitaker, which is a comic book that they wrote, very much inspired by a legacy of Black invention they visited Tuskegee University. The lead character, E.J. Whitaker, is a female inventor who invents many things, androids, flying ships, 
things like this. Her father, her, her guardian is a professor at Tuskegee and uh, she's invented a flying machine and, and adventure ensues. Um, they, the Gibbs sisters have a background in animation and, and uh, sort of creative writing, YA and, and such. And they, they've done multiple comics, but this particular comic, I really felt uh, represented an expression of Afrofuturism, both in terms of like it's sort of black feminist or feminist sort of focus, right? You know, one of the elements that, that finds Afrofuturism is emphasis on intersectionality. So protecting women and, and, and promoting um, understanding of both race and gender oppression is very important. Uh, and so these are the things that are sort of uh, coming together in a very complicated way and doing it through popular culture expression, right? Even Chuck Brown's work, I think, is very, very cognizant of the nature of, of community and the, and the ways that oppressed people have to react and act in the political sphere um, to promote democracy and, and be educated on how the system operates. Hey, so, Julie, the, the last time we saw you, I think, was 2017. Uh, which was, if I remember right, uh, uh, Black Panther was not in in in, in theaters yet, um, yeah. and that film has had just sort of a, a a really remarkable cultural impact. Can you talk to us a little bit about the impact of that film? Right. Well, Black Panther was um, a blockbuster that did a number of things that were incredible at the time. Uh, this was the part of Marvel Cinematic Universe, which, you know, as Black Panther is the first sort of Black superhero, not the first African-American superhero, but the first Black superhero. And in creating that film, they introduced the character, of course, in uh, Captain America Civil War. But Ryan Coogler and the creative team behind Black Panther created a film that captured a kind of diversity and depth of the African diaspora, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a pastiche. Like when you're watching Wakanda, when you're seeing Black Panther, you're seeing uh, myriad sort of cultural references from across the African continent brought together to a mystical place that recognizes at some level the devastating effect, the, the premise recognizes the devastating effect of white imperialism, right? What would have happened if white people had not invaded Africa and plundered it and, and, and created all this destruction. And that original idea that's in the original comic itself is sort of made real and really speaks to, again, what we kind of intuit from our understanding of a longer history of knowledge that's been erased in terms of Africa as a, as a space of progress um, that was, you know, it's excluded from the, from the, the premise uh, of sort of civilization in many ways. And with Black Panther, instead of this sort of Eurocentric framework, we get a, an Afrocentric framework and a framework that speaks directly to alternative forms where there are more positive um, uh, depictions of Black knowledge. There are more positive depictions of like a Black aesthetic. There are more positive um, sort of like narrative around community and equity. Um, there's critiques of Black Panther that you can make the idea of a, a king uh, in the most advanced country in the world. And it's a little bit complicated, <laughs> but um, the I, idea that Black progress uh, and Black knowledge and Black, you know, aesthetic Black beauty are valued and real this is a transformative thing. And in many ways, in, in, in the nature of popular culture, especially the visual culture uh, of the United States and, and in many cases, you know, the entire West, this, this has not been a lot of space here. And in comics in particular, when you look at Black Panther as a historical marker, this is, again, the first Black superhero. But in many ways, this was a decided break from a legacy of, of visual culture that demeaned and 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 stereotyped, and 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 created a, a kind of negative weight around blackness and visual 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 culture, and, and that reflected the, the broader culture, right? And so, in Black Panther, you see that sort of cinematic moment 
in 2018 that's very similar to the the print moment in 1966 when they introduced the character with Jack Kirby's art where even Jack Kirby you know he melds this sort of jungle with techno you know the Kirby crackle to create like this sort of fantastic world that at that time was not imaginable for most white people they could not imagine a technologically advanced African world but again as I point out when you go back and look at black people producing literary work, they often imagine technologically advanced African worlds. So you also are a podcaster, which begs the question, when do you sleep? You have so many things <laughs> that you're doing, but you are a podcaster. Talk about the appeal of that medium. And uh, I don't uh, think, go uh, ahead, Jim. Julian, you got about 45 seconds. Right, well, you know, I, I approach podcasting as a, a public scholarship endeavor. And the reason that I uh, started my first podcast, which was Every Time I Got to Confess, was to try to capture the public intellectual narrative attached to the Zora Neale Hurston Festival, right? You have people drawn to the ideology and ideas represented by Hurston, and also the ideology and ideas represented by the first incorporated African-American town and a sort of liberation, freedom aesthetic associated with that. And so it's always a public scholarship uh, framework that's driving a podcast, be it every time I got to confess or reframing history or the graphic possibilities podcast. Julian, Which I, none of this I do alone, by the way. None of it I do alone. Well, Julian, the, the, the work with your collaborators is remarkable. Thank you so much for being with us. He's Dr. Julian Chambliss. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about story in the public square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org. We can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more story in the public square.